Good evening and good morning, good afternoon, wherever the world you may be joining us. Um, we are delighted to have you here. Um, welcome uh, key members, fellow alumni, uh, past and present board members, alumni council members, faculty, staff. Uh, we are thrilled to have you join us for the 2021 uh, Distinguished Alumna in Residence uh, presentation. My name is Karen finocchio Lubeck. I am class of 1992 and current college key president. With me this evening is our proud 2021 Distinguished Alumna in Residence, Stephanie Smith, class of 1987, and uh, Associate uh, Dean of Students for International Programs, a familiar face to us all, Jean James Reese, uh, who will help introduce Stephanie. To kick things off, I just want to introduce the College Key and who we are. The College Key is an honor organization that recognizes students and alumni for academic, extracurricular, and volunteer leadership for the college. We, as an organization, can uh, impact the student experience. And if we have a quick screen share, Thank you. Um, we impact the students uh, and in multiple ways through our annual dues. And one of our main, main programming is this fabulous program of distinguished alumni, uh, alumni in residence. Founded in 2003 by the College Key, the goal was to bring alumni of note to campus to interact with students and faculty. Fellows will often give a lecture, attend classes, meet with students individually in a group, as well as do a larger presentation for the broader Bates community. Fortunately, uh, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, um, we are delivering this year's uh, DARE presentation virtually. The nice part is, is we are able to open it up globally, real time for real conversation for this incredible program. Past DARE, uh, DARE nominees and fellows have been uh, Dr. Ed Maloney, a lead investigator at McLean Hospital, uh, Brian McGrory, who's the editor in chief of the Boston Globe, Katie Burke, who's the chief people officer at HubSpot. And last year we welcomed representative uh, Jared Golden, Maine uh, second district US Congress. We are thrilled this year to have Stephanie Smith with us and I will pass the, the baton over to James uh, who ha has known Stephanie for quite some time and will do no, no doubt incredible honors with her introduction. Take it over, uh, James. So uh, thank you very much everyone. And uh, hello to you, Stephanie. It is quite an honor for me to have the privilege to introduce you to the College Key community and to the Bates community for this important uh, alumni and residence uh, program. There are many things I could say about Stephanie. Uh, I'll say that in a minute. Uh, I'm coming from outside in the, not the wilds of Maine, but in the lovely, uh, beautiful Maine. I'm at a field in Livermore Falls where uh, actually my son was to have a practice tonight and I'm here for that. And so I like the field motif because in many things I will say about Stephanie, uh, she loved the fields of base as she participated in the athletic uh, teams uh, back in her year, years and uh, was uh, profound and outstanding in all the accomplishments there. Uh, I even am quite impressed at some of the uh, photos that Bates still uses from for lacrosse, you know, to reveal the, the fantastic teams that we have now in the fantastic program. You know, have her little image there, you know, with a uh, aggressive, uh, focused, uh, winning attitude on her face as she undertook uh, all of those activities and excelled in them so well. With a kind of focus that, you know, many of us had not seen before then or since, and that's gonna be one of the themes of my presentation tonight. Now, I could have gone on for two hours for the, for the introduction, so I'll try not to do that. But um, underneath everything I'll say is this is great um, regard and affection for Stephanie that all of her friends have, her peers, her classmates, uh, all of us who knew her here as the administration uh, at Bates and, uh, and, and myself 
uh, in terms of all that she is and what she's about. Let me say a few things. As I just mentioned, there's a high level of respect for Stephanie Smith. As she was at Bates across her years and graduating in 87, uh, each year demonstrated by, there were demonstrations by her peers of the immense regard for <clears throat> her talent, her focus, her intelligence, her commitment, her sincerity, and, uh, and how she would just pinpoint and get things done. And uh, as she graduated and went into the world of uh, military law and specifically in, in, as a, a JAG, um, I know that that's something that they loved about her in the many promotions that she received in terms of that important uh, service. Uh, a few minutes ago, Stephanie asked me about my children and I shared with her about a year ago that uh, uh, my children who are now 15 and 13, I told them that I actually know a Jack and who had graduated from Bates and they were like, wow, <laughs> really? And they were really impressed. And it really speaks to um, how young people can see something that's very important and for me and to know someone as such and for Bates to have produced that person or helped produce that person, um, they were very quite proud themselves that you know someone had gone from these walls into that uh, luxurious career. And uh, it sells so well, as I said, with many promotions along the way. Uh, it leads me, leads me to my next point, which is a point about Stephanie's modesty. <clears throat> she never brags about herself. And, um, so all of us have to do it on her behalf. <laughs> and we're happy to do so as we have over the many years, as I just said, oh, I know someone in JAG, you know, and, and my family was impressed. But as she got these many promotions across her years in that service uh, to, to, the, uh, to the service and to the country, um, she never touted herself, and I think she should have, but she never touted herself. She was always really reasonable and balanced about how she went about things. And I think that um, balance comes from a, a wider understanding and commitment to life that she has. And she's actually very much supported and bolstered by a sense of family. She's a person who takes every endeavor and tries to maximize it to its utmost. She would never tell you that, but it's apparent in terms of all that she has done and, and, and does do. Uh, I even know now, I think, in, She's moved towards, you know, kind of retirement days. She probably has some projects up her sleeves uh, that I'm sure we can all ask her about tonight. And, uh, and once again, she'll be doing that work in an outstanding way because everything she ever did while at Bates and after, afterwards was indeed that. I want to move with something that's gonna surprise Stephanie a little bit and then in another way, not, not surprise her. And as I mentioned earlier, the sense of family, which bolsters her sense of being. I had the privilege of being in a couple opportunities to be around her siblings. Um, and what I noticed about that was that there was an incredible bond there and an incredible level of understanding and strength that's changed among all of her siblings all at the same time. So if I could be a little bit more clear about that, there was a deep understanding of each sibling, and she actually has several of them, uh, about who they are, what they are doing, what they want to do, and the support that they get to do that. So I, I think among many things, it's been wonderful for Stephanie to be able to fall back on that and actually extend that out to those very same siblings and also to the, all the rest of the family members that she has. It leads me to this one example where, uh, at one point, some of her sisters were talking about uh, Stephanie and uh, they were saying things like, oh, here's Stephanie, you know, she's the little one in the family and she is our star. And uh, so the star part, I really understood a lot, you know, um, she excels in academics, on the fields, off the fields and all of these endeavors and of course, you know, after Bates in terms of what she undertook. The part that got me was like, little, the little one? <laughs> there was nothing that Stephanie ever did that impressed us as little at base, you know? <laughs> so she was giant on the field. She was giant in her expression of herself and taking a stance for the things that she believed in. She was giant in the classroom and getting her work done, you know? She was giant and taking on, you know, 
going out into the, the world and, and making a pathway for herself in terms of the choice that she made and also doing very well in that, getting all the accolades and honors with, that the military conferred upon her. And then, you know, giant enough to not even brag about it, you know, as I might have done if that was me. So uh, I like that how the sisters, you know, protected you in terms of being the star and also the little one. I actually understood, but, you know, we were just wanted, all of us at base wanted to pull them aside and say, no, she's a giant, she's not a little one. And with that, I could go on and on, <clears throat> but I know everyone wants to hear, you know, from the star of the show, uh, itself. And once again, it's my privilege and thank you for asking me to make this introduction for you, Stephanie. And we're all very pleased and the community's uh, proud to have you as the alumni in residence. And so officially for this program tonight, I introduce to all of you, Stephanie Smith. Thanks a lot, James. Um, I uh, I am honored uh, that you could make time because I know what it's like as a parent to have your kids uh, waiting uh, to do something and then uh, the anguish that you're dealing with too because practice got canceled. So th that uh, th th those are always the rough rides home. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I am just really humbled and honored uh, to be here. Uh, to talk to um, you all tonight. Um, it's it's funny, you, you just, uh, I always uh, said to myself, I never really was, um, well, when, you could, when you're 10th out of 11 kids, you don't really get to say much or do uh, much uh, because you just do what you're told to do or else you have heck to pay. So, um, so uh, that's uh, certainly the way I was raised, but um, I'm, I'm honored to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you all tonight. I'm looking through the uh, attendees and I'm just so grateful to have so many uh, people that I actually love and hold very dear. Um, who have taken the time out of their busy schedules to, to, uh, to come. I mean, honestly, that means the world to me. So, but I will um, uh, share my screen uh, now and um, uh, hopefully this uh, works. Um, can everybody see? So, um, I titled this Who to Thunk It because um, if you uh, grew up uh, the way I grew up, um, where the biggest decision uh, that I had to make in my life uh, before I turned uh, 12 was, uh, do you want a hamburger or a cheeseburger? And if I said chicken nuggets, um, that wasn't allowed. Okay, so there wasn't a whole lot of, of, uh, of decisions. I wasn't... Uh, Everybody had chores. I came. From, I come from a very, very, very large family. I'm tenth out of eleven kids. Um, my oldest sister went to medical school and graduated when I was like five years old. And everybody left sequentially, uh, year after year after year, to head off to college and and do great things. And so by the time it was uh, my turn to look at. Uh, colleges, I just wanted to find some place where people hadn't been before, and so that I could forge my own uh, place in the world. And um, I, I chose to come to Bates because of the Benjamin E. May Scholarship, and because of the um, rich history and tradition of Benjamin E. Mays as the first Black graduate of uh, Bates, and what that for some reason that just really, really resonated, resonated with me. Um, and uh, I saw that as such an honor that I really felt compelled to try to work every day to live up to the, to the standard that, that was set by that esteemed scholarship. And um, so, but I uh, arrived at Bates very humbly. My mother uh, had just uh, been uh, burned, very badly burned in, a, um, in an accident and had been in a burn unit uh, in uh, New York for almost uh, more than a year. And so when I came to Bates, I didn't have that traditional uh, arriving with your parents, uh, helping you escort your stuff, take your stuff up to your room. I came on a bus and uh, 
uh, took a cab to the campus uh, to begin uh, soccer uh, summer tryouts and, um, and then got started. And um, pretty quickly, my soccer team, my basketball teams, my lacrosse teams, they became my you know, family and very important group of people while I was at Bates. Um, and uh, so I decided to, um, you know, bloom where I was planted and really decided to, to focus hard on academics. I loved the fact that uh, Bates was um, a welcoming community. Many of you uh, don't, uh, may not remember that in the fall of our freshman year, um, in, uh, we had a, uh, uh, the Dean Kerrigan was actually shot by a, a, a student, uh, allegedly shot by a student. And that student was a peer of mine and a friend of mine and a friend of my father's. And it was a very, very confusing time, a very challenging time. And my story about Dean Kerrigan and the grace that he showed throughout that whole um, experience had a profound impact greatly on me in a in a good way, and I and I believe that uh, Dean Ger Dean Kerrigan um, later went on in my junior year when I went and needed a, a dean's recommendation to go into the Marine Corps, and Dean Kerrigan brought me into his office and um, sat me down and really asked me what I wanted to do and. Um, and gave me his blessing to uh, go into the Marine Corps. And I felt that, uh, that that experience of having him be so graceful to me as a fellow black student um, at Bates um, after his experience and returning to the school with such uh, vim and vigor after that um, very challenging experience for him um, just left a, a a great feeling about Bates and um, and my experience there. It was an, it was kind of the closure that I needed after that freshman year of him circling back around and a couple of years later just bestowing such grace um, on me as I was um, making my decision to venture into uh, the military. Um, so I joined the Marine Corps between my junior and my senior year. I went to officer candidate school uh, that summer between my junior and my senior year. And, um, and after I got into the Marine Corps, I mean, it was a heck of an experience. Um, the Marine Corps climate is uh, very, very challenging. Uh, some of you know John Luddy. John Luddy was uh, one year ahead of us and uh, of me and uh, had also joined the Marine Corps. And um, the Marine Corps is 78.3% white male from eight states, primarily in the South. And I mean, uh, we're talking the way South. And, um, and it's also 94%, more than 94% male overall. So, um, and at the time that I joined the Marine Corps, there were only 500 women officer and enlisted in the Marine Corps total. Okay, so the, the numbers were, 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 were basically negligible. And um, so it wasn't even, the 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 five percent the five point whatever percent five point eight percent that exists now, um, and at the time that I retired twenty seven years later, I was the highest ranking African American female in the Marine Corps. Um, since then, um, we have uh, we now have one uh, woman who um, uh, got selected for Brigadier General. So now we have one African American female general, and we have two overall. Um, so the numbers are very paltry. The numbers are very small. Um, and uh, put into perspective, there are over 21,000 um, male officers in the, in the Marine Corps. So when you figure that you have uh, between second lieutenant to uh, one star general, there are um, only 26 African-American women in the military, in the Marine Corps right now, rather. So um, when I was working at the Pentagon, I used to see more African-American uh, colonels uh, in the other branches of service going to get a cup of coffee than we had in the entire uh, Marine Corps. So it was a, it was a, it was a challenging uh, number of years, uh, but uh, so as I always describe it as the best of times and the worst of times. Um, but there were lots of firsts, 
Okay, I was the first uh, female lawyer to go out on a mute in a special operations capable command. The Marine Corps does some really cool stuff out on amphibious warfare ships. They, um, they, uh, the, the, you pull into ports all over the world um, and uh, used to before COVID. And, uh, but then there was lots of, um, so lots of wonderful, wonderful opportunities to really explore the world. And I was a lawyer for four, four ship amphibious ready group that had a special operations capable um, unit. So we did lots of really um, fascinating and wonderful things literally all over the world. And I was able to, in a three year period, uh, basically go to dozens and dozens of countries all over the world. And um, very first to go on amphibious warfare shipping, um, uh, as the Navy was coming to grips with the, the fact that they were in integrating women into the military and their ships and submarines and helped them actually work through a lot of those things. Because as I was deployed on ship, they would often ask me to handle issues that they had um, when I would uh, come on ship. Um, I'm the first uh, female lawyer. I mean, I think actually almost the f only the first female, I'm not quite sure about that, to actually get colonel level command. So uh, in the, towards the latter part of my career from uh, 2011, uh, 20, 2009, 2009 to 2011, I was the uh, uh, battalion commander and uh, had a uh, command in San Diego, um, a recruit training battalion command and had over uh, 5,000 uh, folks that uh, worked for me. And it was, a, it, was a, it was an amazing experience. It was a tremendous amount of responsibility, uh, but the beautiful point was going around and basically doing great, you know, seeing the great work that all the young uh, people did uh, was just truly a blessing and an honor to be able to, um, to, to, to have that experience. Um, I chose operational law as a way to get, get away from the, the, the toxic work environment that, that criminal law and the garden variety judge advocate community provided. Um, my first, uh, my first boss uh, was was very sexist, very racist, um, uh, a good old boy from Texas. And uh, so I had to work my way from the worst job in the office um, up to the, the, the top of the food chain. And I was able to do that in that four year period um, and uh, change things. And uh, so, so good one out over evil, uh, because that was uh, certainly a, a, an interesting way to start my career. And um, so I chose to, uh, he sent me, for example, to Somalia, um, and I handled a second degree murder case in Somalia as a young officer. And he said, he, when he sent me, he said, hey, it's a loser of a case, you're going to go there, get your ass handed to you, and then you can come on home in disgrace. And he really thought he was um, setting me up for failure. Um, and, uh, and of course, I got my two clients acquitted of uh, murder, and they were uh, actually shooting cases. And it became, I learned so much about use of force, uh, all things relevant to the current events uh, today, but I learned so much about use of force um, that that became my expertise. So I um, had to learn on the fly and uh, learn uh, at a time when the access to the internet wasn't, uh, uh, was just beginning. And so I uh, handled some very um, important uh, cases there that got a lot of press and attention. And uh, so that sort of blew up in his face uh, with him trying to set me up for failure, but, uh, but prevailing. Um, after that, I deployed to Kosovo and worked in um, post-conflict reconstruction. So I developed this specialty within my subspecialty of international and operational law to focus on post-conflict reconstruction, which became a very important thing, particularly when you had the Army's uh, plan of um, um, 650 targets, um, even if there wasn't really 650 targets in, in Kosovo. And so we, 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 we bombed the heck out of uh, Kosovo and um, then we had to, to rebuild the country. We had to get the infrastructure uh, working. We had to get the, um, 
the, uh, the judiciary jump started. We had to figure out what we were going to do with all of the folks that had uh, been let out of the insane asylums when the uh, when the places were being bombed, and the challenges were insurmountable. Um, so that uh, experience. And the challenges that we had to face there and figuring out ways in which we had to function when uh, when there was no when there was no really easy answer. And I submit to you that my liberal arts education, my thinking outside the box uh, perspectives um, made all the difference in the world um, and having some sense of 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 enough information about a lot of topics uh, helped me uh, greatly. Uh, so I was able to um, win uh, some naysayers over by actually figuring out uh, how you purchase land in Kosovo so that we could have a, uh, a, uh, a place to, a, 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 a bypass to a uh, border checkpoint between the former uh, Yugoslavia and uh, Kosovo in order to move all the military supplies and equipment that we needed to sustain the entire force that was uh, there in Kosovo. Um, and uh, so I, with a group of um, Marines, hopped in a vehicle. You know, you had to uh, get gunners uh, to go out there and go into Indian country, we called it, and uh, go down into Pristina and figured out who owned this property on the border. And um, and were able to, to, to buy this a strip of land that became an important piece of land to allow us to be able to bypass the uh, border checkpoint to get all of the supplies and equipment before the winter set in and the mountain pass became too uh, impassable. So freak, crazy sequences of events that caused me to gain a lot of uh, traction very early on in my career. Um, lucky events that happened that just made things possible for me to continue to get promoted uh, despite lots of uh, naysayers. Um, I sort of found my home with the infantry. I actually started to uh, work my way up through the, the lower billets that you take in international operational law. Um, and uh, eventually I was the senior operational lawyer in Fallujah, Iraq in 2004. I actually worked directly for the a three-star general who was in charge of the uh, Marine Corps forces that were uh, deployed into Iraq in 2004. And um, we turned over with the infamous 82nd Airborne Division who had held that territory for the preceding year. And um, when I did a turnover with the lawyer uh, from the army and who the army had released uh, 15,000 uh, people that had been rolled up and uh, put in detention just before we took over uh, the sector in uh, the Western uh, Alambar province. Um, he tells me, oh, you know, there's this little investigation going on at the Abu Ghraib prison, but, you know, don't worry about it. It's just nothing. And then uh, a matter of weeks later, the story hits that, you know, it was not, not, just not nothing, but it was a lot of uh, uh, something and a big, huge international incident. And um, obviously we had to take steps uh, at that time to make sure that the taint of what had happened at Abu Ghraib was uh, completely rectified and that we, um, we, the meaning the Marines that took over that sector, that we did everything from an international operational law perspective by the book. And, um, and uh, so that was a incredibly important time that uh, I just was lucky enough to uh, be there or lucky or whatever's the right term. It's not really luck, but, um, you know, uh, to be there at that time when such important events were going on and being having the skill set to to guide my uh, commander and my boss through those um, events and obviously it worked out for him. He later went on to become the commandant of the Marine Corps. He got his fourth star and um, still, still, um, you know, was, was, was took care of me um, as far as getting to the next level as well. Um, after that, the Marine Corps sent me to get my LLM in international law. So I was able to take a year off and uh, go to uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Fantastic opportunity to uh, be taught by some of the 
internationally renowned scholars um, in international law, fantastic experience. Um, and after that, I went and was able to be a mentor, a senior mentor to the Afghan Minister of Defense and the top lawyer in the Afghan army. So I spent a year deployed to um, Afghanistan. Um, fascinating year, lots of um, international law experience, lots of challenges in setting up the judiciary, in trying to teach them not to violate the rule of law and um, focus on um, handling, um, you know, teaching and mentoring um, is a, is a skill set that um, was, was unique to me at that point. And it was a very valuable um, experience that, um, that if anybody had any questions about, I could certainly be able to answer. But, um, but as a result of all of those uh, deployments and that career, I was able to get uh, selected for Colonel at a time when there were, there was, uh, the numbers were very, very low. And, um, and, I, and I made that cut. And that was a, a hugely defining moment um, for me, um, way, way different than what Second Lieutenant Smith could have ever envisioned um, for my path. Um, I never really thought that I would ever uh, get an opportunity to make Colonel, let alone uh, get a command um, at the Colonel level. And um, so it was an amazing, amazing, amazing experience that um, that was was largely very, very positive, but lots of times where when bullets are whizzing over your head, you're wondering whether you made the right uh, decision. Um, I've worked with every kind of leader you can think of, the ones that scream, the ones that talk softly, the ones that, um, you know, that have a clear bias in their in their thinking and those that you know are every kind of leadership experience that you can think of um and i learned to write uh all their correspondence for them and legal correspondence you often have to um and um and and so that helped me in um defining and seeing and developing my own leadership style and my own uh ways of handling things. And that I think was um, a uniquely uh, characteristic thing that I, I submit to you probably would have happened if I was in a major law firm as well, because most of the senior partners would be, you know, very high percentage would be male. Um, but in my 27 years in the Marine Corps, I've only ever worked for one uh, female uh, general, and um, and and it was and it was just such a delight to deal with somebody that you could have this intuitive thinking and understand how they would um, feel. And and so I often wonder what things would be like if I did work in a different um, um, environment, but. That's where I was, and so I just uh, learned and really adapted uh, to that environment quite well. But the highlight of my career really was uh, the Monford Point project, and that was uh, the uh, the commandant had uh, assigned me in my post uh, command billet to um, to anchor the legacy and the history and traditions of the Monford Point Marines, which are the first. African American Marines to come into the Marine Corps in uh, World War II, um, based on Executive Order 8801 um, that came out in uh, June 25th of um, 1941. And the Marine Corps started admitting uh, Blacks into the Marine Corps in 1942, um, of which uh, there were 20,000 men that came, including uh, Mr. Boone, who's uh, an alumnus, an alumna, and uh, um, Karen Boone, my classmate at Bates, is uh, father um, and mother. And I had the privilege of, my father was one of those 20,000 men. And so that my task was to um, gain approval for the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest um, award for significant uh, achievement that Congress uh, bestows on entities within the United States. And um, we were able to um, 
work with uh, dust off my sixth grade civics and uh, politic uh, the House and the Senate and hold events without actually um, campaigning. So those are some interesting legal uh, uh, splitting of hairs uh, because uh, the military is not supposed to gauge in anything uh, political, but we were able to get some approvals to actually bring Monfort pointers up to up to the House, up to the Senate to gain approval for the Congressional Gold Medal. And then my task was to find the uh, Monfort pointers uh, wherever they were. The average age was um, 86 and uh, bring them to Washington DC to receive uh, their medal. And um, uh, so we were able to identify uh, at the time over 400 of them. We were able to um, bring them and a guest to Washington DC to receive the medal and, um, and uh, share in some other festivities at the C Commandant's house in Washington, D.C., at 8th and I in Washington, D.C. And um, that was a come full circle moment uh, for me. It was um, an opportunity for me to um, really truly understand not just my father better um, and maybe perhaps why he was uh, the way he was when we were growing up, but understand in truth what really happened in our era in our country where we did not um, we we did not respect, honor, or or uh, appreciate the contributions that African Americans were bringing to men, in particular, were bringing to the table during World War II and the sacrifices that they made. Um, so it was a very cathartic moment. It was a very um, amazing moment for me uh, personally. And then after that, I felt like I had done everything that I had really wanted to do um, in the Marine Corps. Um, I decided that I didn't wanna travel around 300 days a year and uh, talk about how great the Marine Corps was as the only African-American female Colonel in the Marine Corps, uh, one of 12 female uh, colonels, uh, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want that. Uh, I didn't enjoy doing that. And uh, so I decided to leave and I decided to retire. And uh, so I taught high school in, in uh, Baltimore. I, um, and uh, I chose a particularly difficult school. Um, I like to say that uh, those uh, students, when I first got there, that they would steal the heat off of a biscuit. And, um, and, uh, and it was a very, very challenging environment uh, to be a part of, uh, but they persevered. They came from amazingly challenging backgrounds and we found common ground and we found a mindset that migrated them towards career readiness and, and uh, um, occupations that would allow them to, to, to make a living. And some of them joined the military, many of them did not. Some of them, uh, I was able to tutor them at lunch and after school, and they got into college. And when I stayed there after my fifth year and I had my first student that got into the Naval Academy, he's there now. And uh, I decided I, that was enough. I had, uh, I decided to uh, uh, go to film school uh, because fact really is fancier than fiction. And uh, that all of these experiences that, that I had had over a lifetime, um, I owe it all to Brad Hobbs. Uh, Brad is the one that uh, convinced me that what was I waiting for, that I needed to get off my butt and apply to film school, which I did. And I got in, I went to George Washington University and did a documentary film graduate certificate program. And now I'm finishing up this semester my MFA in film and media studies at American University. Um, my goal is to be a uh, documentary filmmaker, um, to put some of these stories, uh, these experiences that I've had to, to film and be a visual storyteller. Um, I've moved, moving, I'm in the process of moving to Canada um, and I'm um, starting as a, a, a film production company. My company is going to be called Semper Fi Productions. And uh, I'm taking advantage of the tax breaks uh, uh, to, to that, that Canada offers for films uh, to be produced and post-production post 
they give a 40% tax break. So it's a very, very lucrative um, event. And, uh, and that's my goal. So I have uh, unretired and am committing myself uh, to that. Um, and so in, in summation, I, I really believe that honestly, that it was this, that Bates was absolutely the university that I needed at the time. Uh, it gave me the foundation and the skills that I needed to be successful. Um, I really do believe that liberal arts was the key. Um, I uh, re re resisted learning about local politics as well as I should have with Mr. Hodgkin or Professor Hodgkin um, with his enthusiasm for Lewiston and, and Auburn local politics. Um, I didn't appreciate that, but it gave me the perspective that I needed to really understand uh, uh, the situation in Georgia and how uh, things uh, and the locals uh, and how important those uh, races are because I wouldn't have appreciated that had we not had I not had that foray into uh, that kind of local politics. Um, I still believe that liberal arts is is uh, continues to be the answer to the complex and uncertain futures that we all face. Um, as we try and figure out things, one of the things that I always looked for when I was in uh, positions of leadership were people that could think outside the box, because if it was an easy answer, they wouldn't be asking the question. We wouldn't need to know the answer. We need to know what's not there. We need to know what what small things we can extrapolate from other areas to come up with a way ahead to move forward to answer some of the questions that don't have some good and easy answers to it. And I think that all of that I learned um, at Bates and, and all of that I learned it, uh, based on that liberal arts education where we took lots of interesting classes and learned lots of seemingly esoteric things that all seem to gel and meld together to, to provide solutions at critical moments in time. So, um, so I just want to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to even be considered in this, in this category of other distinguished alumna. I, uh, I just always, uh, was uh, out there doing my thing, uh, sort of off the beaten path. I never thought of myself as a unicorn or uh, anything um, odd, uh, just always a squirrel trying to get a nut, just trying to get from point A to point B and, uh, and then uh, life happened and then 30 years happened and then, oh my gosh, here we are. So, um, if anybody has any questions about anything that I've gone over, I'd love to uh, chat with folks and answer any questions I can. But thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Stephanie, fabulous as always. I continue to learn something new every time I hear you speak. And and you really, your story is truly remarkable. We do have a couple of questions that have come in um, through the Q&A. And the first one um, refers to uh, the difficult times when you were facing difficult times. And the question is, who did you uh, lean on for support during the more difficult times in the core, like when you were sent to Somalia and defied all odds? Did you have mentors and sponsors like we do in the private sector? Or as, you know, as James had noted, it was it your family that you leaned into? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I would have to say, honestly, um, it was my family. I did have a, a group of um, funny little story. I got when I got to 29 Palms, I got waylaid in 29 Palms. OK, I was originally supposed to go to Cal to um, to um, Oceanside, to Camp Pendleton, which is the main base on the on the West Coast. And um, out of the blue, my orders just un un like came in and they were changed and um when i got uh to 29 palms and i checked in um as i said my first boss was was more than a little just a little bit prejudiced he was overtly outrageously prejudiced sexist everything he was horrible um and uh but anyway to make a long story short all of a sudden like three other african american officers check in lawyers check in and we're all sitting there saying what happened you know like what how did this happen like what what were you doing well i was supposed to go here and we all got sent here 
And um, it was right before um, the Gulf War. And, um, and apparently there had been a lot of really, a lot of racial tensions in the infantry units in 29 Palms in, um, right before the Gulf War broke out. And, um, and so we were sent there uh, to, to provide um, a defense. Uh, you know, mo some of us were defense attorneys, some of us were prosecutors um, to handle all these cases. And when I say those cases, there was a lot of cases and um, they all had uh, charges of uh, allegations of racial tension on both sides. Um, and some of them, we were able to make a difference. And um, so that was, that was an interesting challenge. And so those other men, those other three other um, African-American officers were, were like, were my kinfolk. I mean, they, we became thick as thieves and, um, and we really worked together to, to, to do what we could for the servicemen that were that were being accused of you know of really petty offenses um, um, specifically because they there was a lot of racial tension so um, but but that was an, that was that was um, my peer group for that uh, period of time and um, and obviously my family I mean my family is always my rock my family is always there for me. They uh, are never short of an opinion as to what I should be doing, how I should do it. Um, so I have learned to um, to just say yes and um, listen to what they have to say, and um, and that they have not steered me wrong. So, yeah, I share your sentiment with. Uh sometimes it's easier for family to say yes. <laughs> uh, we do have um, a couple other great questions um, that are lean into leadership and, um, you know, out of the different experiences you've had, how would you describe your leadership style? And then were there other influences such as athletics or um, other pieces that have helped shape your leadership style, but also the, the confidence and determination and how those fit together? Yeah, I think I think um, that compilation of just these massive ch changes in leadership styles. I mean, I worked for General Mattis, who always called me ma'am and always uh, uh, called me. And of course, he way outranked me uh, always and still does. Um, and um, was just soft spoken. And then you had the hollers, the guys that hollered all the time and screamed all the time. And and uh, um. And, and it's interesting because there's the military is this place where there's these unwritten rules. There's there's well, and many are written, but there's many unwritten rules. And it's one of these um, things where you have to develop your own persona. Um, nobody likes to uh, be get a verbal tongue lashing from from somebody that they view almost like their mother or their big sister. And so there are some challenges as a woman in presenting yourself in a uh, in a in a aggressive and assertive way that is in keeping with the the Marine Corps. I mean, the, the you know this the, we never promised you a rose garden. You know, if if we if we wanted you to put your hands in your pocket, we would have you know all kinds of things. You know, that there's I could uh, I could uh, turn that on quite quickly as far as uh, that persona as well. But. Um, but the but the challenge um, is as a woman you can't come off too strong. You always have to moderate that, and you always have to be mindful of the appearance that you have and how that um, would be taken by the person. Because many of them are these southern men who, if you come on too strong, would just not they will just disregard what you had to say. Um, and then, of course, that creates more challenges because you're not going to let them get away with that because it's the Marine Corps. There's only one standard. It's the Marine Corps standard. But it uh, it's it became a challenge to find that style. And I can honestly say that in the beginning, you emulate a lot of other people's styles that you think are authentic, uh, that you think are are good until you learn about 10 years in where your real style is. And my style was to just be basically uh, very laid back um, up to a point. And they said they would, the Marines would say when they would hear the New York accent come out, that's when they knew that it was getting ready to, to get ugly. And, um, 
and then I would suggest that maybe they were taking my kindness for weakness, and then I would just destroy them. And um, and uh, and 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 sometimes you have to do that too. Um, but but most importantly, you have to let them know no one is going to listen to what you have to say until they think you really care about them. And that was the most important thing that I had to learn was to really be engaged and involved in my Marines' lives, um, to really know what they were going through, to. Uh, to respect the challenges that they were facing and then uh, lead uh, by the, by example. Great. Um, so I want to also be sensitive to time. We do have questions that are coming in the chat. So any that we're not able to get to, um, I will just send along in an email uh, to Stephanie for follow up. Um, but the there is a question that came through around how do you think your experiences with the Marine Corps help shape your world view of the world in the U.S. and I, I think a poignant story was your your when you discuss the differences between when you were in Korea and when you were in Thailand, and the the, the cultural differences there. That was I think the the, the audience would appreciate that. Yeah. So when you're when you're going all around the world, you have to know the cultural norms in the countries that you're dealing with. Like uh, when you're dealing with uh, an you know just making a legal. Uh, points in 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 Korea, for example, if you're not really loud and uh, uh, like aggressive, uh, you're not you're not doing a very good job advocating for your side. But uh, but in Thailand, if you raise your voice or anything like that, I mean, you you they will come down very hard on you. And so there's a lot of learning that had to occur, um, no matter where you go around the world. Obviously, in Afghanistan, uh, I wasn't dealing with uh, folks that were accustomed to to taking advice from women. Um, one out of the two gentlemen that I worked for handled it like a champ. The other guy was just a constant source of, of uh, a problem, and he wasn't even a real lawyer anyway, and that bothered me too. So, um, but uh, go figure. He was uh, the minister in his uh, Noristani, and they, they have a, a tribal name, and so he just got the position because of uh, tribal connections, and so it became a real challenge to operate in that kind of environment. But uh, but yeah, it, I think that um, I saw another question about um, documentary film. I'm gonna make uh, documentary films that deal with social justice issues. I'm currently working on a film uh, about um, following um, inmates that are transitioning from prison out of DC. Uh, we've had to stop uh, filming. I, I had uh, started that and um, uh, but we have to find folks that are transitioning uh, from prison and following them and the challenges that they face and how incongruent many of the laws in um, in the United States, but in particular in the District of Columbia, is with respect to um, um, you know that that are actually become impediments to their making a, a, a transition rather than assisting them in in uh, reintegrating back into society. Um, but right now I'm doing my capstone on, on, um, on the Montfort Point project. And I'm basically telling a story about uh, my father and a few other Montfort Pointers and um, telling the story of the Montfort Point Marines through that, through those uh, gentlemen. So I hope to do uh, Mr. Boone proud. <laughs> as, a, as a Montfort Pointer, I saw that he and his wife were on here, so. Fantastic, fantastic. And so I guess the the final question uh, before we we I'll do concluding remarks is, is, you know, certainly today's times are very different and Bates uh, has, you know, purposeful work and service learning and the 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 thing that I greatly appreciate great Bates is that they continue to iterate about being relevant. Um, you know, are there are there other things that you think that could really benefit Bates students to become really Really balanced between the, the intellectual and the practical knowledge? Are there things that, that you've learned or that you've applied that, that may be beneficial uh, to make more formal either in curriculum or, or activity? I, I think it would be great if, um, you know, uh, w the opportunities presented themselves. I mean, uh, like I, I invited the, the, the lacrosse team to come to San Diego when I was there. And I know that there were wide eyed women 
um, having that sort of intimate experience of living on a base and listening to how recruit training and sort of seeing it, I would take them over to some sections of the base so that they could see how the sausage is made and how uh, that segment of society, which is less than one half of 1% of America, how that is how they are trained and how they uh, and how things work and and it was it, it was a really um, um, awesome experience for women that I knew would have no inclination to go into the military. I think that they really benefited from that experience. So I think that the the things that we do do, giving people those career discovery internships, giving people those hands-on experience to do service learning and work and figure things out again, and um, and it's um it's it's fantastic um for for them to to get for people to get that experience which will help them connect the dots that's what's the key is when you're working your way through a career is to connect the dots so that you understand you take disparate pieces of information and then you connect it to uh, things that you see or read or have tangential experience about. And that's what I think makes a difference. And that's what a liberal arts education provides. Fantastic. And I, I think, um, you know, obviously, uh, tremendously humbled and honored uh, to, to listen to your words um, and to listen to your experiences. And thank you immensely for taking time uh, to share your wisdom with the rest of us. Um, Again, uh, th great thanks to Bates College and the advancement team uh, for helping to put this together. Certainly, James Reese, it's always uh, a pleasure to see you and hear your fine words and, and gracious introduction for Stephanie, um, as well as uh, Stephanie Dumont, who is my uh, right hand on the college campus. So thank you. And on behalf of the College Key, uh, this, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we're leaning into more virtual. It is the way of the world. And as you can see, DARE is such a tremendous opportunity. And I just wanna thank you for, for the dues that help uh, contribute to this. So thank you very much uh, for all that you do. And Stephanie, truly humbled, truly honored. And if you want to learn more about the key and, and where the other impact areas are, please feel free. There's a link that was shared uh, in the chat. And um, it's very easy if you go to Bates.edu and go under alumni and you'll find College Key. So uh, on behalf of the College Key, my executive members, um, thank you uh, and congratulations again. Truly an honor. Thank you and all. And for the rest of you, it's a Fabulous day to be a Bobcat and thank you for, for joining us. Thank you very much.